And now, everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Dave Dean. Hey, everybody. How are you? Uh, on campus here, welcome. And also online, streaming. Um, today, we have some really awesome guests who are veterans of touring, and they're going to share with us some experience and tips and and things about life on the road. So working from stage left to my right, Mr. Martin Santos, uh, also known as Tyke, uh, Hall of Fame 2010, and also uh, worked for Peter Frampton, among other artists. And to his right, uh, Miss uh, Michelle Sobolchek Petnato, uh, who has done everybody from the Spin Doctors to Styx, and our new 2015 Hall of Fame inductee. And to her right, Mr. Jim Petnato, who is a production manager for Siberian Trans-Siberian Orchestra, among other things he'll tell us about eventually. And all the way on the end, Mr. Leon Hopkins, extended Full Sail family and also a crew staff uh, manager for Claire Go Global. So let's welcome them all to our panel. So how's everybody doing? Is it good to escape the uh, tundra of the north? Come down and... It's kind of chilly in here, actually. Yeah, well, you know, it's the equipment. We got to keep it cool. So I just want to open it up, and uh, anybody can take this. Um, what advice? would you have for someone starting out fresh out of, uh, maybe out of a training program because most people don't tour right out of school. They have to go through a little bit of an indoctrination. But uh, what advice would you have for a new student who's going to embark on a touring career? Hmm. Be on time. Be on time. Be on time, be on time, be on time. It's the most important thing in our business. Nothing more important. We yeah. might want to adjust our mics, pull our mics a little closer. <laughs> Can't help it. I'm a sound. We, we don't know much about this. <laughs> There's a few sound people up here as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jim. Do you want to elaborate, Jim? Uh, I would say if you were to poll the top 10 production managers in the world, that would be the number one thing that they said, how did you get your job? How did you get to where you got to be? They were on time. They were on time and they were reliable. Touring, it's built on. You can't do it without it. Uh, I'd back what Jim says and say, I think there's an expression that is, if you're on time, you're late. That's a yep. pretty common statement. Yeah. Uh, I think, would you agree? Yeah, you should be 15 minutes early. Um, you know, just be reliable, be dependable. Um, a big thing in touring is making contacts and just everyone you meet is a potential contact. So it's all kind of in who you know. Um, people get hired because they know someone who needs someone. So every person you meet, just let them know, hey, I want to go on the road. And if they call you, be there and show up on time, If you know, show up early, if not on time. Yeah, that's all good advice. A lot of the very most basic things apply. You know, your work ethic, your, your conduct amongst other people working in a team environment. Um, you know, the, the very fundamental things don't take for granted. That's, it, it applies in this industry very heavily. People look upon um, you to uh, provide, the, you know, the being on time and to, to, to be a smiley face and to be working hard. So, you, you know, you start there. Could I add, I'd say be respectful of other people's space. I, I mean that both per, in the bus, I mean that in the, in the work environment, in the venue. Uh, in a traveling situation, aircraft. Just respect other people's space because it's usually, it's very limited. You're part of a troop. You know, you're part of a troop that everybody has luggage, everybody has stuff. Be respectful. You know, we'll all get, you all get accustomed to the junk bunk, you know, a, a thing called the junk bunk. And you put a bag in the junk bunk. You don't put 10 bags in the junk bunk. Things like that. that I mean, that's common. You know, it's something you would come to learn. Not everyone knows it, you know. But it, 
goes a long way. Yeah, when you're, when you're on tour, you're traveling with a group of people who is not unlike a family, and you've got to live in a confined small space with these people 24-7. So it's very important to respect everybody's space. Don't leave your bags in the front lounge of the bus. You know, keep your stuff confined to your area, which is your bunk, and, you know, some space in the junk bunk. And the big thing is only pack what you can manage because you're going to be carrying those bags everywhere. And when you're doing two or three tours in Europe and carrying those suitcases up and down flights of stairs because there's no elevators, you're going to regret packing too much stuff. So keep it to what you can easily manage. I always tell people, I always tell folks you've got two hands, two arms, two hands. Don't bring more than you can carry on, on the road. Um, you know, seems to work out. Uh, there's something I tell a lot of our new employees. I'll tell them often that you'll never get sent home from a tour because you're bad at audio. And uh, Jimmy and I were talking about this last night. The, the reasons people don't succeed is usually not to, um, from lack of technical know-how, but more of how they <clears throat> work in this team environment and get along and, and are able to go down the road with a group of people and have a successful outcome every day for a show. And, you know, if you, if you focus there as well as your technical skills and your technical education, you, if you can put two together, those both, both of those things together, it's awesome. But at the end of the day, people want to work around people that are hard workers, leaders, um, show respect to others and all that. So it, it's, it's fundamentals that will get you. Just don't overlook that. So aside from being a good roommate, I'm sure most of us know how to kind of be like that. Um, what are some of the um, survival skills you've learned over the years as far as staying out there for months and sometimes years at a time? Anybody could pick that up. Uh, you got to be responsible with your money. Um, that's a big thing. A lot of people tend to, the first time you get on tour, you'll just kind of think, oh, well, I'm on tour now, so this is just going to be my life. But you've got to plan for that downtime. You know, it's right now, this time of year is usually very, very slow. And it's inevitable that people panic in January, like, oh, my God, I don't have any work. What am I going to do? And if you didn't plan and save your money for those few months when things get slow every year, you know, it's, it gets tough. So you've got to be responsible. You know, when you are working, make sure you save up enough money that you have an emergency fund to get through the slow times. And then, you know, as soon as you know a tour is finishing, that your project, whatever project you're on is coming to an end, you want to start looking for your next tour because, it, you know, it could take months to find another one. So just kind of be on top of that and, and be responsible with money so that you're never in a position where you might have to take a tour that you really, really don't want to do because you're broke. A lot of touring people we've seen, you know, you make a good wage, or you can make a really good wage as a touring individual. And don't fall into the trap, or you have to watch to fall into the trap, of living like you're going to make that wage every week for 52 weeks. A lot of touring guys fall into that trap, and what, happened, what Michelle said happens is they realize this tour is over, and now the phone might not ring, and it might not ring for a few months. So you really have to manage that money even though it looks like hey I am I'm doing great you know what there might be two or three months where you don't so that's very important I anecdotally I had back on what both of you said I had a, a client and the crew uh, loved to dine in a manner that I thought was beyond their, <laughs> beyond their means. <laughs> Years ago, there was a, a movie uh, that Michael Keaton was in, and he played uh, he played the editor of a newspaper. And and um, in the course of this movie, there was there was an editor who was moving in circles be, because she was in the press. She was moving in circles of famous people, and so she sort of absorbed that lifestyle. That's dangerous. Your clients are in a probably different financial situation than you might be, not that you're not compensated well, but just because you move in that world does not mean you are of that world. Would that be mm -hmm. accurate? Great advice. Great advice. Truly great advice. So, you know, we, we're talking about money. One of the things I think never gets brought up in these kind of discussions 
I'm going to do it now, taxes. It's that time of year. And I know for myself it can be challenging um, to every year trying to figure it all out as far as per diem and all that kind of stuff. Um, what advice would you all have as far as private contractor? How, what, do you, what is your approach to uh, this time of year? It's, it's pretty much, um, you get hired, at least as far as I, for me, we get hired as an employee of whatever artist. It, it's really hard, unless you incorporate, um, most, most payroll companies won't consider you an independent contractor unless you show that you're an LLC or, or something like that. But um, for me, you know, I'm indep independent, but I get hired as an employee for each project. So I get paid with the W-2 and every year, you know, you have, there's a ton of stuff that you can actually write off because of the job, but like, you know, it's just too intense to keep up on tax laws. So I just have a, a CPA that I go to and give them all my receipts and say, okay, here, you know, do your magic because there's so many things that you don't even realize that, you know, you, with per diem, how that works. And, and that's just too much to, you know, you kind of have to have a degree in that just to, to be able to figure it out. So hire, like find yourself a good accountant because they can save you a lot of money. Otherwise, you know, you just fill out the easy form and you end up paying a ton of tax because of the way you get paid. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to incorporate, you can take, I think, a bigger percentage of, of your expenses, but there's also the other side of that is a little bit more expensive to, you know, do the taxes every year to all the paperwork. So there's kind of a balance. I don't know, are you independent or do you have it? Uh, I, I typically get most of my income as an employee, right. but even so, uh, I would, supporting what Michelle says, I think that it's very, very useful to have a good CPA and particularly one who's conversant with our business right. because there are specific things that apply to our business, uh, things that you have every right to take advantage of under tax code that many CPAs would not know. I think you'll, be, you'll find as starting out, it'll be, you'll be hard pressed to, to find a job where you won't be an employee of someone. Most artists want everyone to be an employee of their touring company, or if you work for Claire, you're going to be an employee of Claire on someone's tour. Uh, I don't think it's something, tax, this tax stuff isn't gonna be something you're gonna have to worry about a lot because you're gonna be an employee, they'll take the deductions, and it'll only be, I think, later in your career as you, if you branch out and you start your own company, then, it, then I think it gets a little more complicated. Uh, yes, I think people that work as an independent <clears throat> have to be a little more cautious and uh, pay attention to where they were, the dates that, you know, they keep track of their income and all that. Um, a lot of companies, like when we pay an independent contractor, they'll get a 1099 at the end of the year. And if, if you work for a lot of different people, you might have a collection of 1099s. So uh, you've got to, you know, do the proper tax things. And, and, and Michelle's right, having a good CPA is, it's worth the money. It really is. Yeah, one strategy I, I learned about was putting money in a bank and so you could pay quarterly and, mm -hmm. and just kind of take it out yourself as your own boss. Um, at, on the road, we get to see a lot of really, really awesome places around the world. Are any of you tourists? Do you get a chance to get out and enjoy where you go? Because I know a lot of times we're very busy and it's hit and run. So I'm just curious if... Uh, What's your most favorite place? And elaborate. Can't do that. <laughs> uh, for me, I, I'm not so much a tourist. Michelle is the tourist. You know, if we are on tour together, uh, she will definitely make us go places. I tend to be more a little bit more of a hotel hermit. So I'm going to throw that to you. <laughs> uh, I definitely have places that I, I like. Um, some of the, sometimes you have time, you know, sometimes you're in a city for such a brief amount of time that you're just too tired to go see anything, but um, there's definitely some cities that I love to get out and see things, like uh, Cologne, Germany is one of my favorite places. Uh, Japan, I love Japan, and I just love checking out, you know, some of the gardens and, and anything there is to see when I'm in Japan. Uh, I agree about Japan. I, I was... As a kid, I, I wanted to, uh, I read in a reader in grade school about a little boy who climbed Mount Fuji with his grandmother. So that was a goal of mine. First time I went to Japan and had the opportunity to do that, I darn well climbed Mount Fuji, which was a lot harder than it sounded in the reader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think if you travel long enough, eventually, eventually you, you'll see a lot of uh, places. There's times when you're going city to city and you'll be in an arena all day, you'll be in a bus all night, and it could go on like that for days. But um, over time, you get a lot of, you know, you will, will see some good places in the world. And uh, but a lot of people, you know, Jim, Jimmy brings up a point. He likes to hang out in the hotel. And the reason that is people have to rest. Because you'll do a lot of shows back to back. And, you know, you got to be healthy to be on the road. This is um, not a party environment at all. The, the people that do really well on the road are health conscientious. And they think about what they can do to, to be sharp for the next load in, the next show, you know, the next round of shows. So a lot of people get out and see sites a little bit, but they have to be mindful to be rested well. You don't want to be that person who comes in after a day off not being at par. And, uh, and it's kind of common. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say it's common, but I'm sure we've all seen it. You have the people who will go out on a day off and really just wreck themselves in some manner so that they come in the next day for work and they're not at 100%, whether they stayed out too late, whether they partied too much, whether they walked too far. You're all, you're, we're all there, we're all there to do the job. So enjoy your day off when you have it, but yeah, rest, you know, get yeah, some right. rest. You, you'll find some of the healthiest people on the road because I always tell people the, the road can either heal you or really hurt you. And it, it's really how you approach it. Um, it's, it's a great place to be, you love your work, you're passionate about it. If you um, don't pay attention to some things along the way, you know, it becomes a hard place to be, and, the, and then you don't enjoy it, you know. Um, it could be several reasons for that, but, you know, when you're on the road, you have to be able to maintain your life um, as it was back home, by example, being able to pay your bills, and, you know, you can work through all that with things online nowadays. I don't think it's too tough, but, but you do have to manage your, the rest of your life, because you're in Paris, and it's, you know, you got bills due every month or whatever you're doing, and you have to set yourself up to, uh, you know, be able to handle the, your personal matters as well. And, and I also um, like to tell people that even though you don't work all year, it's probably healthy that you take time in between projects because you have to recharge your battery, you have to catch up on, on your own personal life. And the, I, I know I've done over, probably type, everybody here's probably done 300 days in a year. It's very difficult. Um, it's fun when you're doing it, but if you do it too much, you can get, you can run your body down. Um, I've been victim of that, flying overseas and back in tours and back-to-back -back, uh, touring, and it can wear you out. So health is a big thing in this industry. You know, I mean, it's, everybody thinks of the atmosphere, and it is, it's a nice atmosphere. It's a fest festival for people that come to shows, but for the people working the shows, it's, you know, it's a pretty, uh, you got to be pretty disciplined to, to maintain over the years. Make sense? Yeah, health is very important, yeah, especially is. internationally. Um, I know certain places you avoid the water. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody ever experienced any, oh, yes. or been around <laughs> anyone who experienced uh, local flavor uh, causing maybe an unhealthy condition. I, I was in Rio de Janeiro for two weeks, <laughs> for three weeks, and I, uh, yeah, had, had some issues there for a while doing some outdoor festivals, Rock and Rio, Rock and Rio 1, I believe. Uh, actually, Rock and Rio 2. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've, you learn about the culture you're in, you learn about the environment, and you do have to be mindful of what to eat, actually, and drink. What to eat, what not to eat. Yeah. And, and you spend a lot of time with bottled water. Yeah, yeah I, I had the same problem in Rio, twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't drink the water in Rio. I feel a little, little left out. I <laughs> Stayed healthy, good. <laughs> I remember when I figured out that the ice cubes, the mm. round ones oh, could with be. the hole, is filtered. Mm. So, and then there's the salad. The salad. The you got to watch out for salad yeah. and ice cubes. Yeah, I'll say this too: that this sound, that, right, is not necessarily always a sound that that was sealed water. Um, 
there are times when in certain low income areas, people will actually glue the caps, refill a water bottle, glue the caps back on with typically super glue. Hey. That being said, it's a good place to start, is go with bottled water. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Excellent advice. Stay with your group, stay hydrated. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. And, and you know, that's an interesting point too, is going out in other places where you're not familiar. You know, you don't want to go out and just wander around someplace. The world's a wonderful place to go visit. Now, I'm not, I don't mean to make it sound like it is, but you know, there's times when you have to be a little bit prudent on, um, you know, if you're going to go out to dinner, you got a day off at seven, eight o'clock. You, you might want to check out what the local scene is a little bit, you know, and um, make sure you're in a, not, not every city's the same. That's all I'm going to say. There are a variety of things that can go upside down, maybe. And it helps to travel, you know, if you're going to go visiting a, a city anywhere in the world, you know, go with your tour mates. You know, you all sort of develop, we all develop day off bonds with, you get a, usually a group of people that you hang with on days off. Don't go out by yourself, you know, I mean, I, I would not recommend going out touristing, walking by yourself. Uh, if something happens to you, no one knows where you are. It, it, it's just hang with, hang with your guys, you know, or with your, you know, with a group of people. Yeah, the, uh, I think the State Department has a good website um, for you to check out and see where you're going and kind of research a little bit because I remember going down to uh, Central America, El Salvador, and they had a thing going there where you can't talk to children. If you're like a strange person, can't say, hey, how you doing? Um, because they had a really bad kidnapping problem down there. So things could be misinterpreted. So the State Department recommended that you don't approach strange children. So little things like that you wouldn't think that would be innocent uh, here in this country. Uh, in other countries, it may be a big deal. I remember also doing a certain hand gesture down in Brazil. <laughs> I, was, I was informed uh, was kind of obscene. But uh, to us, it's perfectly normal to say, OK. That's Germany, too. <laughs> Anybody else encounter such a... We actually, we were on tour um, in Paris uh, the first time, and we had a few days off because the band was shooting a video, and we were walking around, and every time we'd walk into a restaurant, we'd say, table for two, and they'd give us this dirty look, and I'm like, what? And then they, oh, American. Yeah, and okay. And then we got back to the hotel one night after about, I don't know, the fourth or fifth day of this, and our, <laughs> our English tour manager informed us that this is, you know, basically what was the French and English war when the, the English would capture the French bow, you know, and, and chop up their bow fingers, and, and that's how they would taunt the French. So that, you know, is a very rude <laughs> gesture to the French. So every time we'd be, go oh, table for two, it was like, what? You know, but actually the French count on their fingers, they one, two, three. So it's not one, two like we count, it's one, two. So in, in France, anywhere, you want to really, say two, overseas, anywhere it's outside two. of America. <laughs> Two. <laughs> yeah. I just make it a practice. Anytime I leave the continent, this is two. Yeah, you can get in trouble pretty fast. Pretty oh, fast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what would you uh, recommend for a new student starting out? How could they prepare themselves? Because you never know when you're going to get that gig uh, that's going to take you out of the country. Um, how can they prepare and get ready for that? Get a passport um, as soon as you can. Get a passport. Make sure it's uh, up to date. You know, it's that it's not going to expire within um, a year. And you just if you really want to be on the road, just be prepared for opportunities because it could come up that you meet someone. They say, Hey, can we need somebody tomorrow? Can you go? And you've got to take those opportunities when they come because they are few and far between. But that is how you get your your foot in the door. So just be prepared to go at a moment's notice. Another, I guess, another important internationally, a DUI will keep a touring person out of Canada. And if you can't go to Canada, you're useless to most big productions. So don't play down something simple like a DUI. It, that, will, that has prevented me from hiring several people who I like to, to tour with quite a bit because I can't take them to Canada. And you can't tell an international artist, well, your tech can't get into Canada, so you're going to have a substitute today. So 
watch out for that one. That's, a, that's an, a, an international pitfall that you don't really think about until it happens to you. Yeah, that's sure. You've seen it. We've all seen it, right? Uh, yeah. In fact, there's somewhere out there. There's a felon who's named Martin Santos. I don't know who he is, <laughs> but when I find him, we're going to talk <laughs> because uh, because my record is is unimpinged. But there are people who will probably, if, even if you have a fairly unusual name, there's probably someone else on the planet who has your name. It might be worthwhile doing some investigating before you get abroad and find out that, oh, I can't get back into America, because um, that kind of approached me once. Wow. Yeah, we had a truck driver have to park the truck uh, across the border at Niagara Falls, because when he tried to get through, he had a DUI way back, like mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So yeah, you have to take care of business. For sure. Oh, I would recommend uh, for international travel, if you do a lot of fly dates, uh, Global Entry yeah. is yeah. a great program because they kind of do a pre-background check and then you can just kind of sashay through customs when you come back in the country, not have to worry about outstanding warrants because they would have already checked you out. I agree. If you think you're only going to be domestic, you could do TSA pre-check, but that's that's eighty-five dollars. It's just a hundred to go to global entry, so mm -hmm. money's probably better spent that direction. It's a good deal, Leon. Yeah, I was going to say in regards to the Canadian thing, we have employees if they have that issue or they um, there's something on a record and they can't enter, they they would lose fifty percent of what they can make in a year at least, maybe more. So it's quite significant. However, all's not lost. You can get an attorney. There are ways to uh, get it expunged from the record. It's very complicated because it has to happen between uh, the consulate, and you have to have an attorney who can who knows immigration laws, and they can help get the get the whole thing uh, reversed and off the record, if you will. So I mean, it it can be fixed. It, it'll cost you several thousand dollars for an attorney, and it takes a lot of time doesn't happen overnight, but it's a very big inconvenience. If, if you did have that issue, you, you can remedy it, and you'd have to get a good um, immigration attorney. And I was saying that, being, you know, it's, so it's not the end of life, you know. You can, you can get it sorted, but it's tough, very tough. Yeah. And it's expensive. And expensive, it's expensive, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Probably also you just, you don't want to put someone like Jim in a position where you've kept something a secret and then at the last minute, production is surprised with, with something. Maybe you sneak through once or twice before. That's a really, really bad thing. Then you've put, some, you put the whole production in a compromising position. Just don't keep secrets. Yeah, like if, you, if there is something in your record and you get hired on a tour, the first thing you want to do is let the tour manager and production manager know, hey, I've got this in my history, so it might be a problem going into Canada or some other country. Yeah, the border is definitely not the place. <laughs> to reveal, well, I was arrested once because now there are six crew buses waiting for you, which is it's a mess. So, yeah, you want to be up front. You know, at the time of hiring, like when we when we talk to Claire and all our vendors, we'll, we will tell them we're going to Canada. We need to make sure we have no Canada problems. And, and, and also then when we hire people that are a part of our team that work directly for the tour production, it's the same thing. Do you have a Canada problem or any other problems anyway? But that's, that's a big thing now. I mean, it's, it's one of the first questions I ask. Yeah, you can't forget coming off a cruise ship either. Those, uh, sometimes those cruises like the Blues Cruise that goes through Jamaica in various places. There's always that band member who uh, tries to bring back a little special something <laughs> and puts their tour manager in a bad position. Um, so um, we have a lot of international students as well. Um, I guess we could open this up to questions. I'm running out of things to talk about. Can't see you guys out there. Yeah, we're digressing. Do we have the mic yeah. ready for questions? <laughs> Thanks, Annie.
Hi, good afternoon. Um, I have a question that's kind of on a personal level. It's more like how are you able to keep relationships or friendships or keep in touch with your family when you're out on the road all the time? Um, it's a lot easier now with uh, Skype and the internet. Um, but like back when, when we met, we, uh, we met on tour 20 some years ago <laughs> and um, we actually got to tour together uh, about every other year just by coincidence. But on the years we didn't work together, you know, it was a lot of phone calls, you know, and, and we just try and talk every day a little bit just to say, you know, just to kind of check in, you know, with, with the people that you care about. Just, you know, it, it's easy with Skype and FaceTime. There's just so many different ways to stay connected. But with, you know, it, it can be tough on your friendships. Um, you know, relationships are hard too. If the people aren't in the business and don't understand, what do you mean you're not gonna be home for Easter or, you know, my birthday or this or that? It's, it's tough on, on uh, relationships in that aspect. Um, but sometimes your friends too, you know, you can have, you could be gone for six weeks, come home and your friends are kind of <laughs> like, well, you know, you were gone. Like, it's like our whole relationship is just dissolved. So it, it's, it's tough, but, you, uh, yeah, on your part, you can just, you know, make phone calls, Skype, whatever, do whatever you can to stay in touch, Facebook, you know, just kind of keep up with people, and you'll find it's a lot easier than it, it used to be. I'll say, too, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, with respect to friendships and the like, I think that um, sometimes, uh, if anything, maybe, maybe that I tend to have more quality friendships, but maybe less quantity friendships. Mm -hmm. The ones that have endured over the years are people who probably also, even if they're not in our industry, are pretty busy as well. They're, they've got kids or they've got a, a, an engaging job and that consumes a lot of their energy. But you still sort of find ways to, to interact, whether you're texting each other or that kind of thing. Any relationship, whether it be romantic or just friendly or, or familial, requires maintenance. I'll say that. I think you... You nailed it right there in that I've seen, we've probably all seen uh, coworkers who have gone through multiple marriages and coworkers who have strong marriages. And the ones I see that work are when the spouse, whoever is at home, is engaged in their own life and they're not sitting there doting on whoever's on tour. I, I find that those are the ones that work, you know. and. So you have to, I would say, as a relationships go for touring, you would want to avoid a clinger. You know what I mean? You want to avoid the <laughs> clinger at home because that is going to be just acid. You know what I mean? That's, that's the, uh, the bluntest way I could say it. <laughs> it's, um, in my position, um, you know, I work with probably 180 employees. Well, there is attrition over time. You know, there's a point in time when people don't want to travel. And it's different for everybody. Um, and, and the big reason that people that I see leave the road is usually just their, the travel element doesn't work for their personal life. But, but that's something to think about because when you're going to put all your effort into building a career, and, and if it's your passion and what you want to do, it, it is definitely something you can think about. I've, I've also seen people have incredible marriages, raise kids, and it's as if they both have nine to five jobs. You know, it's it's it, it's very. I think um, it depends on the on the people and how their relationship is put together. You know, really. But it is a it's difficult and it's it's a, not an easy thing to do all the time. And any travel industry, I don't. You know, this is one travel industry. There's many other ones, but it would. You know, people are hard pressed to make some things work at points in their life. You know. Um, that's something you have to ask yourself to figure out. Anybody else? Happy to take additional questions. Do me a favor, guys. Just raise your hand and I'll run around the room with the mic. Hello. I am in the show production program and I had a quick question. You spoke about international travel if you are touring with the company. But I've been trying to look out for jobs, and most of the companies I've approached, they do not have any idea how the visa works for international students, you know, because legally we are allowed to work just for a year after we graduate. So is it better for me to approach companies who do a lot of, um, you know, 
uh, touring outside the US so that it's easier to work with the visas or how does it work? I, I kind of deal with a lot of these issues. The, the um, getting a visa, be it, there's so many kinds of visas nowadays. I mean, it's, it's really kind of complicated. But to get like an O-1 visa, you've got to have somebody petition that visa. And it could be a company. There's several angles to that. Um, it's, it's not a very simple route, but it's doable. We've, we've hired people from all over the world. And, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a cost to, to, you know, raising a visa. It could be seven to $9,000 to get one started. It's a lot of money. Um, but more than that, you've got to have a, a reason to, to work in the U.S. It, it just seems like, um, you know, hopefully this gets mended over time. And in your generation, I hope, I hope the, um, you know, the reasons of work and how that all applies, I hope that gets better, you know. But it, it has been a real challenge for us as a company to employ people. But we still try to work through it. If we've got the right people and they're from another country, we'll take the effort and try to figure out how to make it work. But you've got to have someone petition a visa or you got to come in with an artist. Um, it depends what country you're coming from. All the laws are different between the relationship of, let's say, uh, you know, Malaysia in the U.S. and Canada in the U.S. or England in the U.S. So it's very specific to what countries you're traveling between. So it's not a very simple thing. You have to study a little bit. I don't think I have anything to add. That was, I mean, you would be the expert probably of all of us on, on, that, on that application. We, we employ people, uh, you know, mostly on our, on our staff, Canadians. Mm -hmm. And it's a process and, and it's definitely a commitment on the employer's side, financial, as you said. Sure. I mean, you've got to, you know, someone's got to need you in order to outlay that amount of money to get your visa. Yeah, you've got to be what they call an uh, an alien of extraordinary skill, yes, yep. <laughs> and that, that's a that's exactly how it's worded. Yep. And and uh, and as your visa expires after two or three years, there's a, a good bit of time you have you have to plan ahead and renew it. Um, as you're going along, should you get into this situation, save a lot of anything documented that you've been involved in. If there was an article in a magazine of a tour that you were on, and maybe your name's listed. Uh, you know, if the goal is a green card, it takes years, um, and it's doable. We just had a fellow uh, get a green card after maybe the fastest I've ever seen it done, probably seven years. And uh, so, I mean, there's ways to get go about it. It's, you got to have a relationship with uh, with an entity in the U.S. that that needs your employment. Good question. Anybody else? Hi. Um, this is a weird one, but what are your best hygiene tips uh, while you're on tour? That's not weird. That's just really practical. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I always keep hand sanitizer and, um, uh, and baby wipes because uh, you never know where you'll be in a position. Uh, oh, yeah, and if I'm going someplace that um, is not a very developed country, I'll always carry my own toilet paper, believe it or not. Yeah, it, it's funny. Um, some countries in the uh, in Eastern Europe, um, you'll find out in the public restrooms in the venue, they don't have toilet seats. So a lot of times the production manager will send the runner out for a toilet seat, which stays in production all day. And when you have to go to the bathroom, you go get the toilet seat because they just have a problem with people stealing them, I guess. But uh, <laughs> the hand sanitizer, um, some, you know, a it's a commodity. Of Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in the U.S. and in most modern countries, it's not a major issue because you usually have showers at the venue or if, either, if there's not you have a day room where you can shower every day so it's it's a little bit trickier on the smaller like the when you're starting out in the club level if you know everybody's in a van and you know it's tight budget there might be one hotel room for everybody to just go in and take a quick shower after the show or, or whatever but um, it's not not too hard until you get to some really third world countries. Yeah I mean it, it's really hard the hard for me when I've experienced festivals if you're touring festivals, especially Euro festivals, festivals are rough because there's so many people, there's so few showers or no showers, which means you're gonna come off of a muddy field, you're gonna get in a bus, hopefully you're gonna go somewhere and grab a shower, whether you stop at a truck stop or whether you stop at a hotel. 
that can be challenging, you know, I, I think, you know. But if you're touring amphitheaters, arenas, even stadiums, it's really not that, it's not that hard. I mean, there are showers. Every single crew guy is going to be taking a shower there, crew guy or girl, so bring shower shoes. Um, shower shoes that's a, you know, <laughs> you want to do that. Uh, towels are usually provided either by the promoter or some tours carry their own towels. Uh, I've seen people carry their own towel with them, you know. We were talking about days off. I used to go to the laundromat at least once a week on a day off and get in a taxi, go somewhere you know, where there was a coin laundromat and do laundry. Now some of the productions send it out. You, you know, you can put, put a bag of clothes, you know, in the office now they'll have days where they might send it out. Most people just take care of it on their own. So that, that's, doesn't this sound fun? That's great. <laughs> There's a lot of countries that sell uh, antibiotics like Z-Packs over the counter, so a lot of times you can't, you never can call in sick. So I usually pick up one of those or uh, make sure I keep Zycam around for the bad air in all the <laughs> hotels and mm -hmm. planes and such. Yeah, another, you know, another one I carry all the time is um, not endorsing any one product. I use Wisp, those little disposable toothbrushes or, or, or mouthwash if you can, uh, because it's impractical. I have found it impractical on an aircraft to keep. I don't like carrying my toothbrush because it's, it's hard to keep it clean. You're going to drop it or something, and then it's gone. You know, I'm not going to put it back in my mouth. So I, I like those because they're, at least you can use them once and dispose of them. And, and um, especially if you get ill abroad, then you can just use it once and it's gone. And you're not, you're not putting that back in your mouth. Use that bottle of water to brush your teeth too. Yes. yes. Right. Yep. Any other questions? Hi, I was wondering if you guys could give maybe more detail on your guys' careers, like what you've done, what you do now, who you've worked with, that kind of thing. You want to start? Um, well, uh, I principally have been an audio engineer. Um, I have been a, a, an occasional production manager. I was a production manager for an artist for about seven years, actually before I started working for Claire. Um, mainly in uh, those sort of rock and rock pop and country realm. Are, are you looking for like clients or or genre? What are you asking about? Sorry. Oh, you you want the bragger name dropper part? <laughs> ah, see, I hate that part. <laughs> um, I've been fortunate to work for a lot of good clients. I, I, I'm reluctant to share that only, not because I don't want to talk about it, because I sometimes feel like it sends the wrong message. And that is that um, some of my favorite clients did not have large marquee value. And, uh, I, but I found them gratifying to work with because they were good at their craft of, uh, in this case, doing music, and, and they valued my contributions. And some of those were tiny little, tiny little projects. Um, so if you need to know names, <laughs> um, uh, Paul McCartney for several years. He's very small. Yeah, yeah apparently he's so small he can't get into parties after the Grammys, right? <laughs> like, did anyone see that? That was incredible. I had to laugh. Uh, Peter Frampton for a lot of years. Um, the last couple years, a guy named Garth Brooks. He's a country artist. Um, who else? Faith Hill. Oh, you've done a lot. I, yeah. I don't I, know. I could look in the database and. Yeah. <laughs> the police. They were banned in the 80s. But I, I just, I sort of want to de-emphasize that only because I, I don't think that's what we're all about up here. I mean, our client bases happen to be impressive to some, but I, I think it, it's. It, there's no, there's no way you're going to continue that if you don't have, are gratified by the work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I started working in live sound in 1989, right after I graduated at Full Sail. And I did my first tour with a national recording artist in 92, and I've been a front of house engineer ever since, um, spending all my time working on the road. 
Uh, my first tour was with Spin Doctors. I worked for them for several years. Uh, I went on to mix Indigo Girls for quite some time. Um, kind of branched around into a lot of different genres from pop to rock to folk. Um, did Melissa Etheridge, uh, Kesha, Gwen Stefani, uh, Mr. Big, Collective Soul, a uh, boy band called Big Time Rush, which has a TV show. Um, Currently, I'm working for Styx, uh, which was actually my favorite band when I was in high school, so it's really kind of a, a cool gig to be doing. Um, people always say, never work for your heroes because you'll be disappointed, but thankfully, um, they're awesome people, and I'm really loving mixing them. I started out as a lighting guy. Um, I was at LD. Well, back in when I started, you drove the truck with the equipment in it, you set it up, you ran it, you took it down, and then drove away. Uh, I started out like that. I kind of morphed into being a production manager because I was the first guy in the building every day and I was on time. And so someone told me, well, you're going to start to advance the dates. So I started advancing dates and kind of 31 years later, still doing the same thing. Uh, I'm like a tight guy. I hesitate to just throw names out. I currently, for the last five years, been working for uh, Trans-Siberian Trans -Siberian Orchestra as a production manager. But it's uh, been a long and healthy career, I guess. Um, I started out in the, in the music world. I played bass guitar, and I played when I was in college for about seven years after that and decided um, I needed to maybe follow another path as well. So I got into audio. And, and then I toured for about 10 years with, uh, uh, with Shilco, and then I, I moved into a, a position to uh, help work and develop our road staff, our future people. And so that's been my, my career, and it's been all about audio and, and music. So, I mean, it's, they go hand in hand. It's been a, uh, th those things have kind of boosted me through my career, so interest in both areas. Still play, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> he also worked for Genesis, so, which is yeah. very no, cool. Well, you talk about the name dropping. It's when I talk to people, well, why do you want to work for Claire? And they, oh, you guys do all the, you know, these bands, all these. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's point being. That's not the reason you would maybe work for a vendor or a company. You probably want to work for them because they, offer you challenges and they offer you career growth and you want to like the people that you're working with so you want to be if you're looking at a company make sure it's a good mutual fit the the fact that we do bands of the caliber we do is just what we do it'd be like you know you're going to go work for a house builder because you like working with wood you know that's what they do you know what i'm saying same kind of deal you, this is what we do so uh, my <laughs> my advice is when you go talking to companies for employment, uh, make, make sure it's a good fit and, and you're there for, all, for the, all the right reasons and, and the, the rest of it is just fun. Kind of look at it that way. Did that make Hey guys, sense? thanks a lot for coming out. Uh, my name is Vince, um, uh, kind of a follow up to that. Do any of you guys design uh, productions or audio systems, um, anything like that. Um, is it even a part of the career path for what you guys do? Or is, am I thinking of something completely separate from, because I know you guys do production management. Do you, well, as a production manager, I do not design productions. I take a production, or we as a touring company, we take a production from a production designer Typically, the way the world works now, uh, you would get it from a production designer, or you would work with the production designer and the artist to build the show that they want to present. And then it's my job, would, or my position's job, would be to then take that and make it real. So then we would take it, quote it, and then once it's quoted, build it, and then tour it. But I don't design and I don't know I mean I designed when I was a lighting designer back in the day but not show designer Does that, did an, that answer yes your that did answer my question is it kind of the same across the board I'm taking um, if I'm doing a tour where we're carrying a full sound system I'll spec out the system that I want to use 
um, whether it's you know a Claire Brothers PA and how many boxes I want of each type and you know what I want for front fill, how many subs, how many main PA hangs, that kind of thing. I spec out the uh, console, any outboard gear, but um, I'm not you know actually saying okay, well we need to build these speakers. It's just basically you put a spec together for what you want to use, and then it goes out to the vendors. The same for for me. A, a lot of it has to do with communicating. Um, Especially if you're doing one-offs or you're going abroad and maybe you're not carrying production, uh, my involvement, like Michelle's, would be to to put together a a document that hopefully a, a contract writer that is hopefully technically comprehensive enough to pro to spell out to whoever's going to provide the equipment what you need, but is not so exclusive that they can't possibly meet it, um, and then hopefully you have a lot of follow-up conversations to be sure the terms of that paperwork are actually met. <laughs> That's where the production manager comes in. <laughs> Logistic. Enforcer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or begging. A lot of begging sometimes. I'm, I'm working on a cloning program. That <laughs> <laughs> running out of people. You have to know. Um, I, I don't get to it. I get, what I get involved in these days is um, helping maybe steer a program within the company to better uh, in, increase the growth of employees to, to learn more. I get involved in the training, not, not so much hands-on. I do some of it. We have a trainer that does all the technical training. We have several people now that help in that world. But, um, so I'm in more of an administrative kind of role these days. You know, what you're thinking about also might uh, be found in a project manager works for a corporate type company and works with a client who has specific ideas and visions and then they do CAD and all that good stuff. Also Broadway circumstances and um, some corporate events where you've got a, uh, a production designer or a, uh, in Broadway that you even have, you certainly have sound designers. That one that I've worked with a number of times is a guy named Dan Gerhardt. He's very successful. Um, and certainly there's some collaboration with, with him because I'm, I'm sort of fulfilling his design concept and, and we'll have a back and forth about things. Um, but principally under those circumstances, the, um, uh, the nature of the audio design is very much the sound designers. Uh, the, it's strictly more on a, on a partnership basis that we collaborate toward executing that. Does that help? Anybody else? Way over there. Good afternoon. How are you guys? Mm, good. Hey. Um, this this question is geared more towards Michelle and Ty because Leon and Jim kind of like morphed into when one of my classmates asked what, how did you like, who did you work for? But how did you, Michelle and, and Ty, got to where you are right now? Because yesterday at the expo, as I was talking to potential employers, there were they were telling us basically that they weren't looking for LDs or mixers right off the bat. And I am aware where we have to start from the bottom, you know, and eventually get there like you guys are. So I guess my question is like, what, what was the journey? And, and another thing, like, how did you find Full Sail? Because back in the day, there was no internet. I couldn't, you couldn't go on Google and just, She's Type call it. us old, is that right? <laughs> Maybe a you little call bit. us old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Um, well, I, back in the day, I found Full Sail through, I saw a magazine ad, I think it was Mix Magazine, and I had decided in high school I wanted to be a recording engineer, and I just, I wanted to be part of the creative process of making music, but I did not want to be a performer, because I did not want to be on stage. Um, so. I figured, well, if I make records, I can still be involved in, in you know, the music business, but not be a musician. So I had went to college for a year and realized that's not going to get me anywhere. Um, I actually went to the recording workshop, which was a small school in Chillicothe, Ohio, that had a three-week basic recording engineering program. After that, I worked at a radio station for a short time. I went to Nashville for a few weeks to try and get a job knocked on every studio door I could find and realized I still didn't know enough. And that's when I saw an ad for Full Sail and um, sent for the brochure. 
and immediately knew this was going to get me where I wanted to go. And when I graduated, I started working at a little tiny sound company, just doing local bands, local um, PA gigs. And I did that for a few months. I basically worked for practically nothing just to get the experience. Um, I mixed local bands. I, I actually moved back to Florida, worked at a couple nightclubs down. Uh, in, I worked at Church Street Station, which I don't even know if it's still here. Um, it was a big entertainment complex. I worked at a club in Kissimmee. I worked as a stagehand. I did every job I could that had anything to do with audio just to get as much experience as I could and make as many contacts as I could. And my first tour actually came through a friend I made at Full Sail, and he was on tour with the Spin Doctors. And it was kind of before they broke. They were, they were doing really well, but he decided he didn't want to be on the road anymore and knew that I was desperately wanting to be on the road, called me up and offered me the job and said, you know, would you take over for me? And, and I did, and it was just perfect timing because a month later their album broke into the top 100 on Billboard and, and they just kept going from there. So it was a lot, you know, it was a lot of years of just calling people. I mean, actually when I was in full sale, I don't know if you still have to, you know, when you graduate, we had to do a, a, an internship before you actually got your diploma um, way back then. And I had called Claire Brothers repeatedly, begging to do my internship at Claire Brothers because I wanted to go on tour and kept getting told, no, we don't need anybody to go on tour. We just need people to sit in the shop and fix gear. I'm like, I'll do that as long as I know at some point I'm going to have an opportunity to get in the road. And, and I called every sound company I could find and, and sent resumes constantly and every month, like, hey, I want a job and, and heard no, I don't know how many times before you know, I, I ended up getting my first tour. So you really just kind of... You have to be persistent. You have to, like I said, take every job you can in audio. Like someone will hire you, even if it's just a local PA company, whatever. Just get whatever experience you can. Keep working, keep making contacts, and let everybody know what your goal is because eventually someone will actually have something that you can do and, and get you to where you want to go. I, I don't think I could even elaborate on what Michelle just said. I, I think that is it. it uh, be persistent. And perhaps realize that in, the, in that process, as long as it is associated with what you want to do, you're probably getting some useful knowledge out of that process. You're, you're probably going to take away a skill that could be valuable later on. Yeah, like every job you have, even if it's, you know, if you get a, a job that has something to do with audio or what, you, what your goal is, even if you think, oh, I, I, that's not really the job I want, there's always something you can take away from it, whether it's people skills, how to work with people that you don't, don't necessarily like to, or just how to work with difficult people, or how to be diplomatic. Um, there's always something, even if it's not completely related to exactly what you want to be doing, but you can always take something away from every experience. Be on time. <laughs> <laughs> Early is on time. Anybody else? This is mainly regarding things like music festivals. When you guys work at those music festivals, do you have your own videographers that you guys have in your crew? And if you do, what is the best way for a videographer to basically be hired or even get a little bit of spotlight on themselves so you guys sort of recognize them? As a touring production, if you go to a music festival, you, can, you would normally take your own now, did you say video, videographer or video director? Well, actually, just like a camera op or anything regarding in the camera department. So on the touring side, your camera ops, you would normally carry one or two good, real pro camera ops that we put, would be part of your video crew. And oddly enough, a lot of the camera ops you see on tours are repurposed riggers or lighting guys who don't have other show responsibilities because it's very expensive to carry cameramen. So inside your video department, you have, you have your director, your shader, you'll have probably one, maybe two real camera ops that are part of your video team, your LED hanger, and maybe a hippo guy and a lot of those camera ops, as I said, are repurposed members of the tour, the rest of the touring party. When you go into a festival, uh, if you go in there, a lot of times, depending on, will depend on the scope of how you approach a festival or your production, sometimes you roll in there with just your, your director and you use the local camera operators. If you roll in heavy, you bring a few of your own, you probably bring at least your pop star, your primary, either your long lens guy or 
his favorite handheld guy, whoever he or she may be, whoever they work with really well, uh, into a festival situation. And you're speaking specifically about festivals, right? Yeah. Um, so that's how, that's, in my mind, that's how a, a cameraman gets into a festival. Now, the festival themselves will have a video company that will also have camera operators as well. Did I answer your question? Yes. Just as a point of clarification, from a vocabulary standpoint, I think we would generally consider, consider a videographer in our context to be someone who probably travels with the artist maybe to catch things like backstage B-roll, footage like that, archival stuff that may be used for a purpose down the road, cut into a broadcast or something like that. That's actually distinct from the video department, which is part of the show uh, and would be used live in that performance. Is that accurate? Yeah, 100%. Next. Hi, um, this is probably one of a more practical questions. Um, tour bus etiquette, what do you do? <laughs> it's more like what you don't do. Yeah, it's what you don't do. Well, um, one big thing is when you're sleeping on a tour bus, you want to sleep with your head to the back. You never put your head to the front of the bus. Um, there's a reason in case you know there's ever an accident or the driver has to slam on the brakes. It's very easy to break your neck if you're sliding forward. So it's much easier, much better to break your ankles than your neck. Oh. I'll say that bunks, in, in general, the light is always at the aft side of your bunk. So it naturally lends itself to putting your head back, unless you get confused or something. <laughs> uh, um, sorry. sorry. But, uh, smoking, you got to. You know, sometimes tours will have a smoking bus. Sometimes they will have a, a smoking only in the rear lounge. Sometimes all buses will be non-smoking. I don't know if you're a smoker. Uh, it can be problematic for smokers. Uh, you know, that's a big thing. It's become more of a big thing. Back when, when we started, you know, smoking was always, you know, people smoked on buses. Now, different situation, you know. Uh, luggage, you're, you know, you, like Leon said earlier, two hands, two bags. You don't want to be the person who shows up with a teddy bear and a stuffed Nemo and your sleeping bag and a pillow. You know, you have a day bag chip pretty much, a, a, a suitcase that goes in the bay under the bus, be respectful of the space. Um, what did I miss? I, you know, the bus is going to stop on the road, so you'll be at a truck stop and you get off the bus, right? Well, we gotta make sure everybody knows that everybody's back on the bus. And if you're not mindful, I mean, I've seen situations where you know people were. I get a phone call. Well, I'm at this truck stop in Alabama, and I think the bus left. Mm -hmm. You know, I was getting a ham and cheese sandwich. It doesn't happen often, but you, you do have to keep up with things. You know, when you get off the bus, you talk to the driver. Hey, how many minutes we got? Hey, a quick 30-minute break. Make sure you're back on. And then usually someone takes a head count. Hopefully but your buddies are watching your back a little bit. You got to watch out because if everyone's sleeping and you get up, mm, that's, that's the bus right. driver's fueling the bus. He's not there. He doesn't see you get off. No one sees you get off. Yeah. Rule of thumb, if you get off the bus, you don't see the driver, you don't see anything, you take your laminate and you put your laminate on the driver's seat, right? It, it, no, I don't even do that. I make a choke around the steering wheel and I hang <laughs> my laminate on his steering wheel. So say you have to run in to use the, use the restroom, perfectly fine, make sure that, that everyone else is sleeping, there won't be anyone to do a head count. Yeah, so I literally, I'll make a choke around his steering wheel and hang my laminate on his steering wheel. Then he knows. Um, and talking about uh, sleeping bags and pillows, you, you don't need to bring that kind of stuff. Your, your bunk will have a, a pillow, it will have you know the comforter sheets, all that kind of thing, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, you may want to bring like a little neck pillow or something because sometimes the pillows and the bunks are, are less than ideal. But um, yeah, you don't have to worry about any kind of bedding and stuff like that. Um, shoes, be very conscious. Shoes in the aisleways are, sometimes there's nowhere to go with your shoes, but it's, it's always a good idea to try and keep them out of the bunk section in the aisle because when people are getting up in the middle of the night and it's dark and you're tripping over people's shoes, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, so there's usually drawers or maybe even a junk bunk to stash your shoes so they're not on the floor 
don't leave them in the lounge, whatever you do, don't leave them just laying in the front lounge. And for the record, most buses, by and large, no solids in the toilet. Which is a big, which is a big deal. It had actually. to be said. It just had to be said. Yeah. 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 We can. He did you ask do about that us. on that break. Leon was talking. <laughs> also, if you have stinky feet, bring plastic bags and put your shoes in a plastic bag. Uh, we're got to wrap this up, but it's been a great conversation today. Thanks for everybody coming out, and also those of you online. Um, let's give a hand to our guests, Tyke, Michelle, Jim, and Leon. Thank you.